Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Pillar to Post. And the music you just heard, performed by none other than Super Nacho. Yes, you guys all know him here in Pillar to Post as that wild and wacky superhero. Well, I want to thank him very, very much for, uh, well, letting me use his music here on Pillar to Post. And now... It's time for your SmackDown review. And, you know, I'm not going to shit all over the show. I won't do that. Um, just give me one second here because my eyes went a little bit buggy and got to straighten them out a little bit. There we go. Now, there was some good things that happened. There were some funny moments and there was a lot of cringe. Now, we've seen the return of Becky Lynch, which is always a good thing. And, you know, seeing the champ on television, even though she is not wrestling, it is a good thing. Right? She spent two weeks off of uh, television taping. She missed Survivor Series due to the, what they're dubbing, the broken face. Um, she's back. And I think that's a beautiful thing because... I love me some Becky Lynch. And not just because she's a hot chick. No, she is good on the mic. I don't give a shit what anyone says or if people complain that she's hard to understand because of her accent. That accent is beautiful. And it gives her a bit of an edgier sounding voice. You know, more straight up in your face. I'm going to put your teeth down your throat if you keep on crossing me, bitch. And that's what I like about Becky Lynch. And this newfound attitude that she's developed in her career, spot on. Now, I understand that Vince McMahon and, and all the storyliners, they wanted her to become a heel. You can't force it, okay? If you want her to become a heel, you got to make sure the fans are ready to view her as a heel. And that is a fact they are not ready to see because she came out to a standing ovation and damn did the fans go wild and that is what I want to see in any kind of show when the champ arrives now if you're a heel well expect the exact opposite you know you want those fans to be booing and drowning you the fuck out and basically just getting the fuck off of our TV because we don't want to see you. That is the way the fans should be re reacting to a heel as well as a face. A face deserves that big applause. And when you've seen Becky Lynch come out this Tuesday night, wow, off the fucking hook were the fans. And that my friends, is something I love seeing, especially when it comes to Becky Lynch, because she fucking deserves it. Now, uh, she, she, like I said, she cut a very good promo. Um, she came back and basically got into Paige's face, because Paige opened up the show. We're going to start off as, uh, the, the way I wrote my notes down. So, we kicked off SmackDown Live with our SmackDown GM, page and I've got to say can you please ease up on the red lipstick it makes you look so fucked up in the face I'm just saying my opinion that's all that much fucking bright red across your lips it makes your mouth look like it's been through a meat grinder well she welcomes back the Smackdown women's champion Becky Lynch, who obviously returns to a fantastic reception from the WWE fans. I refuse to call them the universe. It just sounds stupid. Now, Lynch goes right into her diatribe, and she goes uh, goes on to say that when you're the hottest thing in the industry, any time away is too much time, and I do got to agree. Her two weeks off of TV... It could have hurt her a lot more than it did. And yes, she's got to step back a little bit, let the other women take a little bit more of a prominent role. But she is back, and she is ready to throw down. 
Now, she goes on to say that she turned up to Survivor Series, but she was stopped and held back. And now she is done watching and is putting herself back in the game. Lynch goes on to say that she had to watch someone stand in her shadow. And then she goes on to call out none other than Charlotte Flair. Well, Lynch addresses Charlotte and says Charlotte came pretty damn close. If it was the champ, however, in that match with Ronda Rousey, she wouldn't have been standing up on Monday Night Raw the next night following Survivor Series. And she doesn't think Charlotte knows who she is. As it took Charlotte trying to tap into Becky Lynch to take the fight to one Ronda Rousey. Now, Charlotte goes on to say she knows very well who she is. And yes, that robotic sounding bitch always just cringes me out all the damn time. Flair denies that she had to tap into Becky Lynch in order to beat up, not win, but beat up Ronda Rousey. Uh, adding that she was just being herself, claiming she is the only woman on either roster to give Rousey a beat down like she did and that's because she is genetically superior well sad fact is you look like you're a dude that got breast implants and a little bit of facial reconstruction oh but that's just me now Lynch goes on to say that uh, she went from copying her old man to copying the man she said this time she won't have her copying her now, Flair says Becky is the one copying her old man and then goes on to say that she continues to ride Flair's coattails. But then tells Lynch to shut the hell up and goes on to address Ronda Rousey that the Queen stands out in the crowd and she will be in the crowd at TLC and then goes on to say she will fight Becky again right then and there. Well, before things can escalate, Paige jumps in, splits up the two of them, and says she loves the new side of Charlotte Flair. I want to ask you, what is so new about the way Flair is ask, acting? You know, it, it makes, makes no sense to me. I see the exact same woman I seen a year ago when I was tuning in on a religious basis. Um, there has been no change, so to me, what the hell? I know they tried twisting her into a fan favorite for a bit, but come on. This is no new Charlotte Flair. This is the same old, same old. And what I got from this, uh, this uh, promo by both women, Becky was listening to what the fans have been talking about since, since that fight went down between Ronda Rousey and Charlotte Flair at Survivor Series. Everyone's been talking about it. That basically, they yes, they had to take Becky Lynch out because of her injury, but they substituted her with Charlotte Flair and did not change anything that should have happened in that match if, if Becky Lynch would have been there. So... Basically, yes, Charlotte Flair had to tap in to what Lynch would have done in that match. And it was good to see that Becky Lynch has been paying attention to what all the fans have been saying. And she used that in this promo. And that's what makes this girl a fantastic rising superstar. And it's about time that uh, WWE started noticing this with her. You know... If you look at everything Becky Lynch does in the ring, there is a reason behind it. When she goes for a pin, it doesn't even matter if it's a false pin. She makes it look like she is trying to go for the win. You get a lot of the other superstars, though. It looks like a lazy cover, and you know right away, false finish. So, to me, everything about this was spot on on Becky Lynch's part. On Charlotte Flair's, it was the same old rehash bullshit I've heard in the past. Now, Paige goes on to say that Charlotte Flair 
and Becky Lynch will be meeting at WWE TLC and it will be for the SmackDown Women's Championship match inside the Tables, Ladders, and Chairs match. Well, to me, that wouldn't sit well with me and it didn't with the other women in the locker room either because they took offense to this of them being excluded from what, not just a title match, but another first for the women's division, the Tables, Ladders, and Chairs. So they are interrupted by Mandy Rose, Zelina Vega, Sonia Deville, and the Iconics. Rose surprisingly has the uh, microphone and says it is a joke. And the reality is that any of them could have done the same thing to Ronda Rousey and any of them deserve a title match against Becky Lynch. Rose goes on to say Paige left absolution and now only gives opportunities to her old PCB teammates. But now they are stopped by none other than Naomi, Asuka, Lana, and Carmella. And Carmella says that they, I'm sorry, Naomi says they couldn't help overhear Mandy and they agree and says that she knows Paige isn't questioning her desire. Lynch surprisingly agrees and says she will slap the head off uh, any one of them. Paige says she loves it and then says every woman will be involved in a battle royal within the main event. The winner will be added to the triple threat TLC match at tables, ladders, and chairs. That is our upcoming WWE pay-per-view. Um, you know, I seen it coming, and when I seen all involved, I only seen one woman that should go on, sadly, but it's true. Uh, I said this on Monday Night Raw. They need to mix it up a little bit. They need to bring some fresh faces in. They need a stronger and bigger women's division. Just my thoughts. Now, we move there into a, um, a match but we get a little clip of some backstage uh, mishaps between The Bar and The Big Show. And they're blaming Big Show for them getting beat up at the Thanksgiving food fight or whatever it was. That Big Show was sleeping on the table. And where was he to help them? And then Cesaro goes so far as to snap the singlet strap on the pectoral region of The Big Show. Uh, now, this got a laugh out of me because I seen where it was going and it looks so beautiful. Big Show's hand comes out, gives uh, Cesaro a nice little crack right on the jaw, and down goes Cesaro, gets caught by Sheamus, and this, uh, this little threesome that they've had going is now null and void. So no longer supporting the bar is the Big Show. Oh, excuse me. We move that into the match. Yes, the Bar versus the Usos. And I dig this match because I love the Usos. And I love how far the Bar has come as a tag team. They work better together. They look like a tag team. It isn't, there is no longer this team that was just thrown together because they had nothing to do for them. They are a legit tag team now and they look like it. They perform like it. And that's the way the tag team division should be. Okay? Yes, sometimes throwing two guys together, it works, it clicks. And so often we've seen where they throw two guys in together and it's just for like a two-month kind of deal. And then it's a backstabbing ordeal and there's a feud. Okay? It works if there's a feud angle involved. But for the most part, they just dissolve the tag team and that's it. So, the tag team champions take control of the pace in the early exchanges of the match. Uh, we quickly go back, uh, go to a commercial, but we come back and the bar hits some great double teamwork moon maneuvers on Jimmy Uso. Sheamus rocks Uso with a big knee to the face. Jimmy manages to send Sheamus packing and th through a hot tag is made as Jey Uso pays a tribute to Roman Reigns and hits an uppercut before paying tribute to their father. Yes, the old 
ass in the face in the corner maneuver. You gotta love it. That big old thump of the rump. And the Usos love paying tribute to their daddy in a big way. Now, Sheamus gets a blind tag, which Jay doesn't see. He then looks to fly over the top rope, but is caught by Cesaro with a huge uppercut, which gives Sheamus the advantage. The Celtic Warrior hits a knee drop uh, from the second rope and then follows it up by going to the top rope, but Jay avoids it and sends him crashing to the ring post. Jay then hits a big super kick, but Sheamus kicks out just in time before the three count is made to keep the match going. Jimmy and Jay both head to the top ropes and look for the frog splash combo, but Cesaro catches Jay with an uppercut whilst uh, Sheamus gets his knees up and goes for the roll-up victory, but Jimmy once again kicks out before the three count is made, and it was a very near fall. A lot of false finishes in this match, and that's what made it look really good. The Usos then nearly catch Cesaro out, but the brothers then catch the Swiss Superman with a double kick to the head and follow it up with a frog splash to pick up a major win over the tag champions. Yes, your winners of the match, it was Jimmy and Jey Uso. The Usos. A nice little tip, a nice little win, and it could take them back into contention for that uh, tag team SmackDown titles. Now, from here we go to a backstage segment. It's the New Day, and they're shown next to uh, The Miz, mocking him for his embarrassing defeat last week. And Kofi Kingston reminds him that they picked up the only win for SmackDown. Excuse me. But Miz quickly reminds them that they were eliminated and claims he can beat any of them. Miz claims he will ask his co-bestie Shane McMahon for a match against one of them tonight. From that little dialogue in the locker room, we move to a scene where it shows AJ Styles sitting in the locker room, his head lowered and viewing, looking like he's in deep contemplation when one of the stagehands comes up and says, hey, it's time. We go for to a commercial and then comes back and it is a promo with AJ Styles. And I'm going to say this right before I get into this. Um, AJ Styles always has been exceptional on the mic. Um, there's one guy, yes, he's a lot smaller than a lot of the guys in wrestling, but his performance, his mic skills has always been above a lot of the wrestlers out there today. And that is why WWE made a really good catch on landing him in a contract with WWE. Now AJ Styles goes on to say that 14 days he has been without the WWE Championship and they seem to have been a lot longer than the 371 days he had with it. Styles says he hates losing but then everyone else does as well. But it's the way that he lost that bothers him the most. Styles didn't think the target would move from his back to somewhere else. And if you remember the match at, uh, well, uh, right before Survivor Series, it was a nice old-fashioned, big old punch right to the ball sack. Now, he goes on to say that uh, he has been in the position where you will do anything to win. But what bothers him is when Daniel Bryan kicks him in the face after the match was already finished. Which meant he wasn't medically cleared for Survivor Series or The Last Smackdown Live. Styles says he is looking forward to smashing Bryan's face in. But they can do it right here, right now. However... Brian isn't here, and Styles adds that at the live events, Brian wasn't there either, and says someone has been watching a little too much Raw and seeing how they do things over there, and I've got to fucking agree. If you are the champion, besides being injured, you should be on television. You should be doing all the functions a champion is supposed to do. Now, it's not saying that Daniel Bryan isn't doing that. It is storyline and the way it's going to work out. But it was a direct shot at the way they 
run Raw and the Universal Champion. Brock's, Brock Lesnar gets to sit his ass at home and let everyone else work while he sits at home, collects paychecks. And the title doesn't get de defended, therefore does not gain prestige. Now, he goes on to say that for 371 days, he didn't miss a live event, a pay-per-view, or a SmackDown Live. He goes on to tell Brian to bring his dreams and excuses to TLC, but most importantly tells him not to forget the title, as it belongs to him. As always, AJ Styles always hits it out of the ballpark when he is doing a promo, and if you've ever seen him in the ring, I haven't really seen too many bad matches on his part, and that's what I love about AJ Styles. He's got a great work ethic inside that ring and outside of it. He gives up a lot of time for his family, and a lot of wrestlers do. But when you are at the height where you carry the gold, and I'm talking about the big gold in WWE, your job is a never-ending task of getting over and staying on top. And AJ Styles does that far better than a lot of the superstars do. We move into our Rusev versus Shinsuke Nakamura match. Now, we all know Shinsuke Nakamura is your United States champion. But I don't believe he was looking forward for a competitive match last night, especially against a man like Rusev. Rusev, he is a good, strong style fighter as well. You know, he knows how to deliver those massive kicks. And, you know, seeing this, what happened in this match... It really, really cemented Shinsuke as that major heel. And I'm sorry for the dragon going off. And when I say dragon, I mean the furnace down here in the basement. I'm looking to relocate the dungeon into better uh, uh, better conditions. But uh, it is what it is for the time being. Until I can lead internet up to the second floor, well, the dragon is going to be my housemate, my dungeon mate for quite some time. Now, before the match can even get off and started, Shinsuke Nakamura attacks Rusev from behind and then hits him with the Kinshasa, which sends him out of the ring. After that, the champion rocks Rusev yet again with another Kinshasa, running down the ramp before walking away and getting split up by the referees. Like I said, the match didn't go anywhere, but it cemented Shinsuke as a major heel. Now, it might have made him look like a chicken shit at the same time, but when you're a heel, you're going to do anything and everything to maintain your status, especially when you've got a championship like the U.S. title. We then move into the Jeff Hardy 20th anniversary celebration. This does not make sense to me because he has not been under contract with WWE for 20 straight years okay not even 20 years broken up but i understand why they do that because anything he did outside of wwe is not canon when it comes to wwe now michael cole welcomes jeff hardy to the ring to celebrate the fact that he's reached 20 years with wwe um you know and he starts it off by showing a video package of highlights from Hardy's career. And they were all good moments. A lot of death-defying actions that have, you know, surprisingly not crippled this young guy completely. Well, Hardy finally uh, speaks and he says he doesn't know what to say after watching that, but thank you. He goes on to say he can't believe he did half of that stuff and says this business has given him the creative outlet which is so cool. Hardy says no matter what he has done over the years, the fans have stood by his side, and for that he is eternal great, eternally grateful. Jeff then thanks his family for making his night possible and says that this is far from a retirement speech, but goes on to say that he will find out or that they will all find out together. As Jeff wraps things up, while well, Samoa Joe makes his way out and says congratulations to Jeff and said he is sorry he's late as he was popping bottles, but then realized that champagne around Jeff Hardy isn't the best idea. 
Now Shane McMahon tries to stop uh, Samoa Joe, but Jeff lets him through and allows him to have an open floor and say what he wants to say. Joe continues to take shots at Hardy's drinking and drug past. Uh, he says he doesn't celebrate weakness or second chances, especially when there are men like him who are yet to get their first. Joe goes on to say, for as many times as he has made the fans get up from their seats, there are just as many times that Jeff Hardy has let them down. He goes on to add that the demons never go away, and the next time he feels powerless, he will offer Jeff a one-step program. Well, Hardy goes on to say he can't rain on his parade tonight and calls Joe out for a fight. Well, Joe begins to make his way down the ramp and then quickly about faces, heads back to the locker room and through the crowd of superstars there to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Jeff Hardy in WWE. So a feud lining up between Samoa Joe and Jeff Hardy. That should be good. That I do agree. But they've done this in the past. If you guys all remember that they did this with Jake the Snake Roberts with his drinking and drug fueled past. They did it with Stone Cold um, pouring alcohol down the throat. It might have been a gimmick bottle. Could have been iced tea for all you know. But it was at a time where Jake the Snake was trying to get back to right and look what it did to him. Now Jake the Snake has a lot of demons and it could have been you know, a storyline that, you know, yes, it brought it to light, but it did so much damage in the end as well. And you go back a little bit further than that, and you look at what they did with Hawks drinking and drug fuel past, and where that went. That killed the man's fucking career. You know? Um, I don't think Hawk was ever right after doing that, uh, that storyline. And, and it pains me to see that they're doing this now with Jeff Hardy. It shouldn't be done. Yes, the fans all know the past of these wrestlers and their issues and their, you know, their demons. Their demons are laid out before us, especially guys that risk so much in the ring. We all know they're in pain day in, day out. From the day they, or from the morning when they open up their eyes till they go to bed at night, and even when they're sleeping. Man, I go through that on a daily basis. I can understand what these guys go through by putting their body through so much torture. And to use this storyline to fuel of a feud between Joe and Hardy, I think it is despicable. The lowest form of heat that a wrestler like Joe can have, well, that they force him to put out there. We all know Joe is a badass. He don't need cheap heat to get over as a heel. He could have simply come out there, knocked the piss right out of Jeff Hardy, and we all would have known it's on. But no, they resorted to this fucking bullshit once again, and it sickens me, okay? It's bullshit. From there, we move on to Kofi Kingston versus The Miz. And I, I, I've been over the New Day since the first month they started this gimmick. Uh, I'm so over it now. The pancakes, the fucking cereal, the fucking trombone, the, all of it. it it's, it's over done. Well, we're going to jump right into the match. The Miz starts out in full control and immediately puts Kofi Kingston down on the mat, but the New Day members quickly, uh, I'm sorry, the New Day member quickly turns things around and sends Miz to the outside of the ring and then teases diving out, but bumps back, utilizing the ropes. Woods and Big E begin to distract Miz, and as he turns around, Kingston comes flying through the air, hitting a suicide dive. Now we go back, we go to commercial, and when we come back, Kingston once again catches Miz out, uh, excuse me, who was trying to jump from the top rope and only ended up eating a drop kick from Kingston. Kingston follows that up with a boom drop, but Miz is smart enough to reverse the 
and uh, then hits the attempted trouble in paradise. I'm sorry, he manages to outsmart Kingston, and uh, my notes aren't very good. Sorry, outsmarts King uh, Kingston and reverses the attempted trouble in paradise. Kofi then gets in his reversal in through shoving Miz into the ropes to hit the, uh, the SOS, but Miz is able to kick out just in the nick of time. Miz then uh, takes off the top turnbuckle pad, but Big E is smart enough and gets a stack of pancakes, yes, pancakes, to stop him from making uh, the most of it. Woods then begins playing the trumpet, but Miz hits him with a big boot to the face, which almost causes E to get involved, though he thinks better of it, which the uh, with the official's back turn, Miz grabs a chair, but Woods pulls it away, and as he enters the ring again, Cody hits the trouble in paradise, and it's all over. Kofi Kingston then gets the win over Miz. Now... Uh, a lot of shenanigans being played. Yes, it's supposed to be comedy relief. Um, you know, it, it, I don't know if it's just the gimmick that's just overly done or whatnot, but the, the tandem, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a big fan of Kofi Kingston. I truly am. I love the way he flies in the ring. I love the way he moves. Um, Big E, for a powerful ho powerhouse that he is, relegated to comic relief i would love to see this guy back in the ring doing solo and just beating the shit out of people the guy's big he's a bruiser and he can get downright nasty we've seen his uh past career it could be so much more for these men uh xavier woods you know he could be teamed up with anyone him and kofi do make a good tag team but they're relegated to simple comedic relief um, we follow that up with the Randy Orton little dialogue here. Yes, a little segment with Randy Orton, and it's to discuss his actions against Rey Mysterio the prior week, where he tried to rip off the mask and humiliate one Rey Mysterio. Now, a lot of Hispanics and a lot of Luchador fans were pretty upset with the way he attempted to remove the, uh, the mask. A lot of outspoken people there. And they find it very disrespectful to the Lucha um, history and everything that involves wearing a mask in Mexico and, while well, places like Japan as well. Now, Randy Orton lists some words that the fans have chosen to describe his actions as of last week. But, if he had to choose one word, he would pick euphoric. He said he never understood what the big deal was or what was so special about the trash he ripped off of Mysterio's face. Goes on to say he didn't bother to learn the history because he didn't care. He said it wasn't meant to disrespect the culture, but it was to humiliate the man hiding beneath the mask and to take him down off that pedestal that the fans have put him up on. Goes on to say he proved that, <clears throat> excuse me, Excuse me. He said that he proved that at this stage in his career, all Ray is is another one of his victims. A victim of the three most destructive letters in the history of WWE. And you know what those three letters are. The R-K-O. Well, good to see Ray Mysterio not one to back down. He comes out on stage a neck brace in hand. Or around a neck brace in hand. No, a neck brace around his neck, supporting his his injured neck. Uh, heads down quickly, well not quickly, but somberly, down to and takes the fight to Orton. But the Viper quickly gains control and bounces him off the barricades as he tries to rip at the mask once again. With Orton trying to get back into the ring, Mysterio takes advantage and sets him up for the 619. After hitting the one six one nine, Ray goes to the outside, which I think was a big mistake, to grab a chair, but gets caught in the ropes when he returns and is planned with the classic middle rope uh, DDT. Orton then smashes Mysterio down into the steel chairs or stairs with a chair locked under his throat, bouncing his neck and his head from the weapon, and he is quickly sent to the back. Yes, 
right away officials breaking it up and getting in between uh, Rey Mysterio as well as Randy Orton. And I got to say, you know, it's good to see Rey Mysterio back in WWE. Um, it's good to see him in a good feud. Randy Orton, not one to back down from a good feud. And it has been intense already. Uh, I like seeing it between the two. Um, you know, and attacking the, uh, the mask is a big thing. And it really shows disrespect for your opponent, especially a luchador who wears that mask with pride. Now, back in WCW, we all remember that uh, Rey Mysterio had lost that mask once before, and he had a small career in there as a regular wrestler without the mask. But when he got hired on to WWE, he brought the mask back, and he brought that honor back to it and now being disrespected by Randy Orton this is going to fuel the the tensions and the and the the war between them and I can't wait to see what these guys do in the ring we all know it always looks like a one-sided match when you're you're stepping in the ring and you've got a guy the size of Rey Mysterio and then giants among men he's got he's been pitted up against but Rey Mysterio has proven in the past he can carry these matches he can make them look good and I'm just hoping he's still at that time in his career that he can still do it. Um, Battle Royal. Yes, the women coming at you. We get Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch sitting at the announce table. None of them have a mic in their face. They're just sitting there watching the action. And, you know, my prediction when I seen this match, I had one name on my lips. And it was Asuka. Because she is the only one that makes sense to be going forward. Especially in the type of match this is at TLC. And especially with the two women that are involved. Now, like I said, Battle Royal. So it's over the top. And you're eliminated. The first elimination takes place as Zelina Vega is eliminated by none other than Lana. Yes, Lana is pushed out of the ring. Uh, but not over the top. And with Vega standing on the apron, Lana takes advantage and removes her from the match. Back from commercial, the Iconics get revenge for Vega and eliminate Lana. They turn around to uh, fan favorite Asuka, who has no issues in dealing with them, and she hits a running hip attack that takes both the Iconics out of this battle royal. Um... However, she gets caught by a huge super kick from Carmella. Asuka then eliminates the former champion, and we are down to DeVille, Mandy Rose, Asuka, and Naomi. Now, Naomi comes to the aid of her tag team partner and hits Rose with a rear view before a huge springboard kick to DeVille. Rose flips Naomi on the ring apron, but she hits the splits and then sends Rose packing. But she doesn't get a minute's breath as DeVille runs from behind to eliminate Naomi. We're down now between Asuka and DeVille. And then both of them attempt to hit a flurry of kicks. But it's a spear by DeVille that works. And then Rose tries to grab Asuka's foot to help her friend out trying to pull her off the apron, but it doesn't work as Asuka hits a running kick and takes out Mandy Rose. Asuka then pulls DeVille onto the apron with her and the two women trade blows. But in the end, like I said, it's Asuka who gets the win. Now, a very straightforward battle royal, very quickly done. Um, not really anything that's going to uh, push anyone further besides Asuka, who I believe, like I stated earlier, deserves the win, deserves to go to TS TLC to be in that triple threat between the man, Becky Lynch, and Charlotte Flair. It's going to be quite the match. I want to see this match. Asuka's always phenomenal in the ring. Becky is always phenomenal in the ring. Take away her promoing. Charlotte Flair's pretty damn good in that ring as well and I'm sorry for the hiccups folks all in all Smackdown I had uh, I struggled I did I struggled through some of it um, almost fell asleep on a couple of uh, of, uh, of the matches but uh, all in all I think it fared 
slightly better than raw. I wouldn't give it too much though. Um, very poor, very poorly done all around. I did love the promos by AJ Styles and Becky Lynch. Um, I hated Charlotte Flair talking at all. Um, you know, the celebration of 20 years in WWE, I don't think it needed to be done. I think it was filler. They didn't know what else to do. Instead of giving them more matches out, no. Nope. They're going to do a celebration to set up this bad, badly set feud between Samoa Joe and Jeff Hardy. Uh, still shaking my head over the route they took for this feud, but it is what it is. Um, I know Jeff Hardy. Yes, he's not the same guy he used to be. He might not be able to move as quickly, but his matches are going to be entertaining. Samoa Joe lethal is always going to be an exceptional match. I can't wait to see it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me. And it might not have been a great Monday Night Raw. It might not have been a great SmackDown, but it is wrestling. And I'll be here each and every week to give you my views on it, my opinions. And uh, later on tonight, it's NXT. I will be sitting there because I need to be fueled by some good wrestling. And NXT has always been proving that they have good wrestling. So, for the time being, I am out of here. I am the angry Viking Pete Wall. Have a great day. Have a better tomorrow. And I'll see you all soon when I hit you up with a little bit of warrior way from our WO and some scourge. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great time. It's time to get going. I'm out of here.